Hello. Welcome to Call It Like I See It, presented by Disruption Now. I'm James Keyes, and in this episode of Call It Like I See It, we're going to consider how much of a role politicians and the law should have in personal health care decisions, particularly in light of the leaked Supreme Court draft opinion, which would overturn Roe v. Wade, as well as what we've seen over the past year or so with the COVID vaccine mandates or the threatened ones or whatever. And later on, we're going to take a look at some of the rec- some, some recent findings which demonstrate that modern humans, which is, you know, homo sapiens, have been around even longer than was previ- previously established and which would open the door for more interaction with the prehistoric other homo species, the other, you know, type of beings like us that were around and so forth. Joining me today is a man who can tell you what to do when they come for you. Tunde Ogonlana. Tunde, are you ready to bring the people into your inner circle? Yeah, only if they pay their way. <laughs> all right, all right. Now everyone's welcome in. Everybody's for free. welcome in. There, yeah. Oh, 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 that's breaking news. Yeah, they get a <laughs> lollipop and a goodie bag on the door on the way in. There you go. Now, we're recording this on May 16th, 2022, and over the past few few decades in the U.S., we've all lived kind of in a societal environment where in many instances, politicians and others who had access to the the levers of power in our government were legally restricted on how much control they had over a person's personal health care decisions. An example of this would be abortion, you know, where Roe v. Wade, which was a 1973 Supreme Court decision, and it guaranteed the constitutional protection of abortion rights to, to a, a substantial extent. It formed essentially a line in the sand to, to keep uh, various state governments or whichever, when any government back. And then on the flip side, we've also been living in where there's areas where the government could force one to make certain healthcare decisions, like to get a vaccine, you know, compulsory vaccines and so forth, whether it be, you know, for, for kids or whatever it was. Now, there was actually a Supreme Court decision that paved the way for this vaccine mandate, which was Jacobson v. Massachusetts, and that confirmed that states can enforce compulsory vaccine laws, and that dates all the way back to 1905. So we've lived in this society where both of these things, both of these thoughts and practices have been going on, and we've been able to keep them straight. Our heads haven't exploded or anything, but the ground appears that it may be shifting on this a little bit. We've seen a Supreme Court draft opinion which overturns, just flatly overturns Roe v. Wade. And this would signal a a substantial change in how our society is balancing the amount of control that politicians and the society at large has over certain personal health care decisions. But at the same time, or, you know, going back the past couple of years in the COVID pandemic, we saw a lot of pushback on vaccine mandates and that becoming potentially a partisan issue where there may be some organized push to, to change that precedent that we've been living under as well. But Tunde, let's start at the abortion issue. What was your reaction to the leaked draft itself and more broadly to this apparent push to take freedom away from the individual on this issue and allow the state to dictate outcomes? I mean, I wasn't surprised, um, put it this way. And and it's interesting because I know there's been a speculation I've seen on the news, various programs about the leak and all that. I could, uh, first of all, I don't know who leaked it, so I'm not that special, but, um, (laughs) but, uh, I could see both sides having a reason to want to get this out ahead of any potential ruling on it, um, or decision. So let's, and, and, and we need to acknowledge, right. They haven't decided anything yet. So we still want to see how this plays out in the next month or two from this recording, but. But that's an interesting um, point. I just, just to piggyback on that, that. The, the it definitely you can see interests being served by, on either side with this being leaked the way that it was, and so it, it's it actually makes it a deeper mystery in a sense. Like some people, if, you, if people want to be partisan, they can just always point to the other side and say the other side did it, you know, and then only look at the reasons why they would think the other side did it. But you can come up with very coherent reasons why either side here would want to to get this leaked in advance of it coming out, and not to just hit people out of nowhere, you know, in July or something like that. But go ahead. Yeah. I mean, clearly we didn't have enough to, to BS about in this country. They, they, <laughs> we, they thought we were all getting bored. So some smooth said, sailing. Let me, let yeah, me leak all this. Yeah. Let, me leak this. let me leak this and, and, and let's just get people excited about something. Um, 
But um, but no, and, and and what's interesting to me about this because it brings back up, um, not really bringing up because we like you said, abortion has been front and center our whole lives. You know, we're both born in the late seventies, so we were born after this Supreme Court decision. Um, so for our whole lives, there have been people trying to um, undo Roe versus Wade, and it looks like they may have finally out of decades of hard work, you know, gotten there. Yeah. So, so that's why part of this to me is just, you know, the old, like you've said, in other kind of cultural and political battles, it comes down to who wants it more, who's been more organized behind the scenes, who, you know, this is why, um, quote unquote, you know, Republicans and conservatives have been focused on the courts for so many years, right? They, they, this, is, this is all playing out the way that, that's why I said, I'm not surprised that this 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 um, could potentially happen, the overturning of Roe versus Wade. One of the things that did strike out to me, though, um, was because I started pre- preparation for today, of course, started doing some reading. And first thing, and one of the things I read, I'll quote, uh, it says, Roe versus Wade was a landmark decision of the U.S. Supreme Court in which the court ruled that the Constitution of the United States protects a pregnant woman's liberty to choose to have an abortion without excessive government restriction. The first thing I thought in my head is that's a very conservative ruling. <laughs> you know, like I thought I thought it was all about keeping the government out of uh, individual liberty, out of your face and out of your personal decisions and yeah. the yeah. the ability to have privacy. And like you said, individual liberty. So it, it just it again strikes me as one of these things where um, the labels that people say they claim tend to morph based on as individuals, what they see as their, you know, their kind of their, their situational ethic at the moment or their moral thing. Cause in some, like you said, in one way, and, it, and it's interesting how both sides are, are similar on this, right? Like I'd say most of the people that seem to not uh, like the government telling them to wear masks or that, you know, there should be vaccine mandates tend to be the type of people that politically support taking away Roe versus Wade. Yeah. And the people that are pro-choice and want to keep Roe versus Wade also politically tended to be the ones that wanted the government to do vaccine mandates and, and do the mass. So it's interesting how you got a little bit of both mixed into it based on what people believe, then they want the government to do that on mass. And if they don't believe it, they're like, government, get off my back. And it's just... Yeah, it's just like it, you can, you could on the surface level boil it down to I want the government to to do what I think is important, and I don't want the government to do anything that I think it, or that is not an overwhelming comp- compelling thing to me. Now, yeah. since you mentioned that, I will say that there is one distinguishing point that, from a legal standpoint, that you'll see, and that is the, the getting an abortion does not implicate necessarily the same public health issue as a communicable disease. So, and we'll, we can get on, get into this more later, but, yeah, but you're a there lawyer. is a piece there. Well, yeah, I'm a lawyer. So I'm looking I know, at that. So I'm not, but so I'm going to throw I will food. say this though also. Well, let me I'm say I'm going to throw this. tomatoes at the TV. <laughs> that's what I do. You, you, you sit there and think about stuff like this. <laughs> well, yeah, that's what, that's what jumps out to me when I see it. But the other one, on the other hand, you know, implicates more of a religious type of, which I thought you were going to mention, but it, you did like that. And not, you know, like that's why we're both here, but the religious piece where, something that would be considered a violation of someone's faith, so to speak, you know, and, and that's, what's interesting about that is that obviously our morals and, you know, we'll, we'll be discussing this in future, future shows, you know, when, when we go into, we're going to take a closer look at some morality and so forth and where it comes from, but people's morals can come from a lot of different things. Uh, And their law in some ways is going to be influenced by someone's faith. If you're a person of faith, now we're supposed to have a hard line there, you know, though where you know the matters of faith aren't supposed to dictate our laws. So th- there's it's stickier when you get to the abortion issue on that versus the the vaccine issue on that. And less and until then, you know, people say, oh, well, these were tested a certain way, and so therefore my, these vaccines were tested. So we've seen that argument; these were tested a certain way, and so I can't use them for that reason or anything like that. So all of these things, to your point reveal a situational ethic that we see but well, i would say generally my but, reaction i would you know just to, to, to go into that initial piece was it, it i actually went my reaction was similar to yours and just that like this has been the organizing principle of the approach to the judiciary branch of, go- of federal government on the right for like at least 40 years like so that this happened it, it seemed like this was an eventuality more than anything in the sense that this is what they have been working to do 
for a very long time. This is why Mitch McConnell got rid of the filibuster for judicial nominees. This is why many people in the Republican Party, for example, who did not like Donald Trump, but he promised to give them the judges that they wanted. And he said they went along with it. This is paying off on that bet, you know? And so it, to me, it was, you know, that it happened now. It's like, okay, well, I would, I would imagine this is what they've been building to. And they succeeded in that sense. And that is something that that's how our society works. There's ebbs and flows to these things. They've been since Roe v. Wade or the aftermath of that, there have been, there's been a highly motivated. And as you pointed out, very organized, and passionate group of people who have been working to do this. And they used, in many ways, the democratic process. Some some, some ways, I would say, it wasn't really the, the, the way you're supposed to go about things when you start talking about blocking Supreme Court, or not considering Supreme Court justice, justices that have been duly nominated. But I will say this. Well, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll go ahead. I know you wanted to jump back in um, because there, there was another one point I wanted to make, but I, I, I wanted you to give you a chance to respond. Well, yeah, no, one of the things that I just going back to the religion part real quick, because that that stuck out to me, too. So I just wanted to 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 say a piece before we jump from here. Number one is, um, you know, the Constitution doesn't say anything specific about abortion. Maybe it doesn't even say anything about privacy um, uh, as opposed to due process. Right. Um, but neither does the Bible, to my knowledge, uh, nor the Quran, nor the Torah say anything about abortion. Uh, specifically. So it just, this is again, goes back to where people um, choose what they want their hot button to be ba- out of any document that they consider sacred, right? So, because there's a lot of good stuff in the Bible that I never hear talked about, like, yeah, you we'd know, be to, spending all treat people, you know, and no, all that. Tune in. You know? We would be spending all our time on poverty if people were really living. Yeah, living that's what I'm saying. Like, like, like that's there's all a lot of doing there's a lot of poverty. very, very good things about how to treat people in the Bible that I never hear get talked about. Um, and so, and so, what I'm getting at is the people that say that they're, let's say, constitutional originalists, that they believe, unless it's in the Constitution, written there by the guys who are alive in the late late 1700s, and and, and it was just how they intended, then it's, then it's illegitimate. It shouldn't be part of our conversation as a country. And I'm just, that's what I was joking in my head thinking, yeah, but they're not originalists with the Bible. <laughs> but I don't see abortion or any of some of this stuff that we talk about in today's politics and all that, not in the Bible, but they bring it all, but they, but, but they say this is all about religion. And my point though is also just to add in there that our first amendment takes care of this argument about religion in any of these decisions, because Correct. that first is amendment, in the Constitution. <laughs> yeah, the, the First Amendment says that Congress will not legislate any form of religion or anything religious in that sense. So, what, whatever, and that's I want to be very clear here because religion. This is why I think the healthcare topic is very um, sensitive because it does involve things like our bodies, you know, things that are, are deep seated beliefs about um, not only our bodies but things like sex, reproduction, all that. Which for a lot of us, uh, the morality of that is founded in some sort of religion. So the point I'm making here is trying to have this conversation with a scalpel, not a sledgehammer, is I'm not knocking or bashing religious religion in my statement. What I'm trying to differentiate is that this country was founded by men who came out of kind of that Protestant and Catholic fights in England and in, and in Europe. And they, they all knew what these passions could lead to. So they try to create a society that would keep the religion separate from the governing part. And yeah. everyone and from, is free. And people making laws based on religion. Like, Correct. Saying, okay, so, well, so, this is what my faith says, so therefore and, we have to make this a law. And that's a great point because we all remember how many laws we talked about this on other shows. At the state level, there was over 200 laws passed between 2010 and 2020 about not having Sharia law in the United States. Yeah. So we tend to not like the idea of a theocracy. Right. And like, well, at least one is someone else that might, you know, <laughs> want, want to do it. And I think that goes back to the point why I bring up the, why I thought about the religion part in the constitution is that's already settled. So that's, I'll get off my horse and pass it back. <laughs> well, I'll tell you this. One other thing that I wanted to mention on this is, is, and this is about just the, the, this push to, to, to move this from an issue of personal liberty and freedom to one that the state dictates is, is the Supreme Court really is the tip of the spear here. You know, like the action is really happening on the state and then potentially on the federal level at some point. Um, once this protection, because remember what Bro v. Wade did was put a, a line in the sand or put a border around what the government could make laws about as it relates to this issue. 
And so we're seeing though, you know, like that we're seeing state efforts like that have a fascist bent going on. And I don't say that lightly, like, you know, laws that are going up that says you, you, you can't get an abortion and then you can't, you can't get an abortion in this state. You can't get an abortion in another state. And mm-hmm. we're going to set up checkpoints at the highway. If you're going from Texas to New Mexico or something like that and make sure if you're pregnant, then we might detain you. And like this, th- there is an effort here. Like this is not fun in games, basically. I, and I, I want to say that just because to me, I've taken this seriously the whole time. I've heard people say, hey, yeah. we, we have to overturn Roe v. Wade. This is our organizing principle for this and that. And I believe people when they say that. And so, therefore, when I see this happen, it's like, okay, well, they've worked hard. You know, like they've been doing this. They've been, you know, I commend their efforts, so to speak, their organization. Um, and and I, I, obviously, I'm not happy with the outcome. But if they're going to work that hard and nobody's working that hard against them, as you said, who, who wants it more? Then up until now, at least, they've wanted it more. So we'll see if that galvanizes people against it. But this is, you know, and in, in, in other things, though, you know, just we got bounties now and in, in, on the books in states like you, you turn in, spy on your fellow citizens, turn them in, uh, you know, things like that. It, it's something that where we have to look at what the Supreme Court is doing and understand, OK, yeah, that's notable. That's a shiny object. But we can't stop our evaluation there. What's up? What's happening and what's about to happen here? is the action actually is, is the other shoe that's going to drop. When we see what uh, several states, half of the states or whatever it's going to be, put very serious restrictions on people, turn their citizens into, you know, the reporting agents against the other. And where we see, we, we can get an example of this is like with voting rights. You know, as the the, the Voting Rights Act was, was whittled away and whittled away in terms of what the preclearance issue when certain states had to get preclearance for changes they wanted to make to their voting, that they got rid of that in the last 20 years or so. Um, after that, that happened and everybody's like, oh no, that's a pretty serious big, that's a big deal. But at that moment, we didn't see the full effect. We didn't see the full effect until over the past 10 years or so when we've seen the extreme levels of gerrymandering, the extreme levels of voter disenfranchisement, disenfranchisement that that has allowed. And so really, like I said, what we're seeing now is, okay, this, this is happening, but what's about the the other shoe is where it's going to, you're really going to see how this, what, what kind of society we're going to move to as a result of this. So, yeah. Oh, go ahead. If you have well, to- no, I was going to say that, um, you know, the, the interesting thing is for those, and you're right, like, that's what I'm saying. Like people who aren't fans of this, um, you know, potential for Roe v. Wade to be taken away, really need to really think hard about how um, they want to respond to this and be strategic because, you know, the Republicans and conservatives are being rewarded right now for 40 years of hard work yeah. and, and focus. And this is, it's interesting. You know, I think I've heard now, you know, I've heard all these stats that as much as 70% of the United States population is okay with either keeping Roe as is or keeping some form of legalized abortion, you know, around. So what's happening is remember the term activist judges and all that. Yeah. Those were terms used to galvanize and, and, and coalesce uh, people that were pro-life uh, in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s because the Republican Party was smart in one way. They knew that they didn't have the popular support to overturn Roe versus Wade. So if you can't do it from the ballot box by having politicians win elections who are going to campaign on overturning Roe versus Wade, then what you need to do is you need to play the parlor trick games that have been played over the last few decades, gerrymandering, electoral college, all that, and make sure that you can ram in judges that will do exactly what appears to be happening, right? A case in Mississippi was contested and then was sent to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court looks like, based on this leaked document, may rule to overturn Roe versus Wade. So there's a very... Um, for those that want to pay attention, and I think that's the problem with a lot of the people that oppose um, uh, or that are pro-choice, I should say, that oppose this decision to overturn Roe Ro versus Wade, they only show up to, in the street to protest. They're asleep at the wheel when the heavy lifting is going on when it's not election time. So that's what I would say to people that are not happy with the potential direction all this is going, is that yeah. they need to just be awake at all times, not just when it's time to get in the street. Well, yeah, I mean, and just one point of clarification, like the, the, the numbers suggest that they did have the votes to get politicians to run on the, 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 the pro-life or the anti-choice position or whatever, like public support 
was less in favor of of rights to terminate a pre- pregnancy if you go back 49 years or, or 40 years and so forth. But because the Supreme Court tied it to the Constitution, they didn't have the support to do a constitutional amendment, to amend the Constitution, to overturn what the, the Supreme Court said as far as tying it to a constitutional right. So that would necessitated going after judges to get to, to have the judges overturn their previous decision. So it, it happens to be that as they mustered the judicial strength to overturn Roe v. Wade, they actually lost the popular support to an overwhelming degree. And so that, that's just kind of an interesting footnote with yeah. this. And so now the, the popular support is squarely, you know, it's not 50, 50, it's not, you know, whatever it was, 45, 55 or whatever, it's 70% plus. And so, you know, but, the hard work in working on the judiciary has paid off from that standpoint. So your point is still well taken. Uh, just wanted to clarify that it wouldn't have been necessarily a law. It would be more like a, an amendment to have to try to take out what the, the Supreme Court did. But nonetheless, I, I want to look at this also from a different lens, though. And that lens is with the vaccine mandate, because on one hand, what the abortion issue looked at or, or the way that was embodied and historically over the last 49 years was a pr- the government being prevented the a, a, a government whether it be a state government whatever being prevented from infringing on the liberty of woman's liberty in terms of making personal health decisions related to abortion uh, up to a certain point and so that is a putting the handcuffs on the government to say that to, to stop people from or to excuse me that prevents the government from stopping people from making a certain choice related to health care the vaccine issue is, you know, kind of an inverse, but it, it really invokes the same thing in the sense that that is where the government will make laws not to say you can't do something, but to say you have to do something, a compulsory vaccination, so to speak. And so and we've seen like that's been you cited when we did a show uh, related to the vaccine mandates, you know, a while back, you cited that case, you know, that that Jacobson v. Massachusetts case, going back to 1905, that said that the government can do that. So looking at what we did or what the way we, things were reacted to on the vaccine side, side by side with the re- direction things are going with the with the abortion. What stands out to you about how these issues are are discussed and reacted to? What stands out to me is really the kind of what we've been talking about is that the, these issues and this is like, I think this is what makes it stands out is okay. that, that we have the, the kind of freedom in our society, things like freedom of speech, because. You know, in China and certain other, you know, Russia, I don't want to keep picking on the same authoritarian countries, but we could even pick on third world countries, you know. Well, they're the big ones. So that's, it's, it's kind of, you know. You, you're- no, I know. I'm, I'm just making a point, like, whether it's the Congo or, or Myanmar or wherever these kind of countries are that have more of a top-down style, I'm pretty sure whatever they say the rule is for your health care, that's what it is. Yeah. And, you know, and there's no, like, complaining. There's no, I'm not going to stay in my house because of COVID and all that. Yeah. They just get forced to do it. And so... Um, and so I think this part of what stands out to me is- If they don't do it, then their neighbor will report them and the government will come get them. Yeah. And, 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 and that's, again, the interesting thing here is because what stands out to me is this is how people react in when they have the ability to, right? Yeah. In a freer society, when, when they can say things like, it's against my religion, or I don't believe this was in our founding document 200 years ago. So there's, 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 um, you know, part of this messiness is because we have our freedoms. And I think, you know, it's interesting, like you said about what you just said about in the authoritarian systems, the Russias, the Chinas, that people rat on each other yeah. and they're taught to rat on each other. And it's interesting how in a country that says it so much loves freedom, that we have states like Texas that just came out with a law that deputizes anyone to write on someone else yeah, to get paid it 10 grand. It. Yeah, it yeah, encourages it by and, and if, financial rewards. Yeah, so for for if they get a healthcare procedure done. So the point is, is that this is why things like freedom of speech are important and why the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is so important because even in a country like ours, which has a culture of saying it loves freedom, it loves privacy, it loves independence, um, we can see through the way that certain state legislatures have behaved in recent years that all they, they care more about control. And it could be control here of what people do with their bodies. Um, we've had shows about the control that they're trying to do now about education and what people are taught from a historic standpoint about how what happened in this country's past. Yeah. So, so it's interesting 
that from a culture of people that say they love freedom and openness, um, how, how scared they are of allowing people to make their own free choices. Um, you know, and so it's just, that's to me kind of what stands out about this. It's, whole almost, thing. it's just, almost like you have a freedom to agree with me, but if you don't agree with me, then a certain issue, then that freedom kind of ends at that point. And like, in terms of, yeah, we, I mean, we talked about that last yeah, week yeah. though, in terms of yeah. how you and I just in our own personal journeys independently have kind of learned how a lot of that talk is performative. You know, it is yeah. something that people say things to get it's almost like you know playing to the crowd like a wrestler would do or something you know it's you know doing a little twirl and putting your hand into your ear or something because you know that that those are the, the buzzwords that the crowd wants to hear but a lot of times it's not something that you they're looking really for you to deliver on except to the extent it's things that where hey if you agree with me or if you think the way i think then you have you you're free to say whatever you want to say but if you want to teach somebody something that i don't like then you're not free to do that you know we don't have freedom of speech then but what stands out to me actually is actually how difficult the balance is because i you know at the beginning i i kind of mentioned how you know well you know with the vaccines that invokes or you know like the the vaccines is a a an example because that's actually a health procedure whereas like the masks, it kind of raises the same kind of feeling that we saw, pushback that we saw, but it's not even a health procedure. That's like kind of, that's not much different than making people wear shoes, you know, like in terms of what we do in society. But the balance is very difficult, I think. And I think that we should all appreciate that the balance on how much control politicians or anyone, really anyone. I mean, people want to get their hands on the lever of, of power in government usually because they want power to do stuff. They don't want to just be there, you know, because they like the view, you know, but either way, like how much control they should have, whether their intentions matter, you know, if it's all, oh, if I want to do this law because this is the way, because based on my religion, I think that you know, the, the life starts, you know, at conception. And I think that we should change birth certificates from birth, birth. I think birth date is irrelevant. We should just say conception date on birth certificates and start tracking everything there. I, and it, it, I look at the, the, the intersection there is, is one of, uh, it's kind of silly. I, I use that example because I started thinking like, well, hold, hold on. If my wife is pregnant, should I be able to, to claim an extra dependent on my taxes? You know, or if, if a kind of pregnant women drive in HOV two lanes just by themselves, like how far <laughs> out, you know, culture. Well, technically, if 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 you believe that birth begins, I mean, life begins at conception, that HOV lane comment is actually pretty interesting. I'm, so, hey, what about the tax thing? Same thing. What about, <laughs> like, all, like, I say that just to point out that well, hold on. cultural. <laughs> Go ahead. I got go. one for you. <laughs> I don't know if you want to go down this road because I don't know what if it's healthcare, uh, culture, or whatever. But if if you had to make a choice, being could a fetus be trans? Oh my goodness! <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah. That's, At what that's, point do they become a boy? <laughs> well, see, I, but that, that's a bad question for me because I'm a biology person, so I'm a science person. So I, I can't like I can't go down that I road. Just, I just wanted to see your face. That's all. I wish, <laughs> I wish the audience because if we had a TV show, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a visual. Or it's not a visual medium. So, but no, I mean, I, anyway, I, I keep I going. Point out, yeah, I point out, <laughs> like culturally, we've accepted a certain definition of what you know being a person is, or you know, but but. I, I say that to say, like, beyond someone's intentions, but I want to make this law because I believe this for a religious reason, or I want to make this because I think it's good for public health. It's it's really helpful to have some independent way to ju- to, to to evaluate these things, and so because what we're seeing is it's a difficult issue, and if you're just evaluating each one based on a sliding scale of of whatever is invoked by it. Oh, well, this one invokes my religion. This one invokes my concern over public health, yada, yada, yada. Then you will end up tying yourself in pretzels if you ever try to be consistent about it. It's a difficult issue. We need some way to evaluate whether or not the government should have any, because I'm one that would lean more towards the government should be staying out of it. But I also recognize though, that that probably, it doesn't work for that to be an absolute right either. So that really my reaction is, is, to just take note, looking at both of these, it's a it's a difficult balance. It's a difficult path to walk to to to, to stay in a space that's coherent. Well, let me help you here because you're not the only person to have um, uh, see this as a complexity. I was, I, as I was doing my own research, you know me, I love the history stuff. So I said, okay, how long has this debate been going on in America? So in 1821. Mm -hmm. Connecticut passed the first state statute banning abortion in the United States. Oh, wow. And it says, um, 
you know, 30 out of the 37 states uh, prior to, you know, 1900, um, and six of the 10 U.S. territories had codified laws which restricted abortion, along with the Kingdom of Hawaii, where abortion had once been common. Every state had abortion legislation by 1900. So, again, this is something, and here's what I was thinking, too, because that was interesting to read that the Kingdom of Hawaii um, had, had, had restricted it, but it had once been common there. Yeah. Which is interesting, which tells me, okay, you know, back when it was the Kingdom of Hawaii, when it was Polynesian, um, maybe culturally there was just, it wasn't um, uh, seen as a, as a moral failing maybe to, to do something like this, where in our culture it was. So by the time America kind of took over Hawaii, you know, the, 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 the situation changed. And I just found that interesting reading that, that part of me felt like, well, there must be a part of this that involves also the technology of the time. Mm. Because I'm thinking that, you know, probably by the late 1800s or the 1800s, um, the technology of gynecology and all that had changed to a point where you could do something like abort a baby in with a procedure, let's put it that way, versus maybe back in like a thousand years ago, it was, you know, they give you some plants or something that just you know, kill the fetus that, that you ingest as a woman. So that's what got me thinking about it too, is yeah, as, as probably the, the technology got better and easier for a doctor to just do this within, you know, a short period of time and the woman to, 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 to generally leave without being totally scarred or inability to have future children. Um, they were probably happening more and more, which then brought this into a discussion in the, in the bigger level of the society. Should well, this but be there's, all, there's another piece you have to consider there, and that is that if you you know re- recall that childbirth was no sure thing for most of human history, you know, in terms of the baby survival, you know, like and and, and not just childbirth, but up to two years, you know, it's one of those things that there having a kid didn't mean that you were going to raise a kid, so to speak, for for much much time. So as technology evolved and science evolved, and they were able to keep people alive better, there may have been more of a it it may have come up to where you know like people it may not have come up as much when people lost half of their kids before two years old anyway so to speak so the societies change cultures that's a good point yeah how things go change and so our society is going to be and then the other piece i should say with this is that we just have a lot more people and a lot more people really close together now and so we have to we have to deal with more people more different agendas more different mindsets in terms of our day-to-day life now. So again, that's why I keep coming back to, okay, well, we need some way to evaluate these types of things that don't just default to, well, I think this because of my religion, or I think this because of this or that or whatever, because we'll never get to a place where we can live with the result. We collectively can live with the result. We don't have to agree with the result, but we have to be all be able to live to a certain degree with the result. Um, and we're, we're not going to get to that point if there's no kind of agreed upon, like that's why we have law is to try to get to some agreed upon, okay, this isn't the, 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 the may, this may not be the best way to deal with this, but it's a way to deal with this seems relatively reasonable, a speed limit, for example, like it's like, okay, well, you know, like we could just make a law that says, Hey, drive safely, <laughs> you know, but how are we going to evaluate that? So we create this, an arbitrary number in many respects. Now, you know, they take into account, you know, the, the physics of driving around from what I understand, but it, it's relatively arbitrary. It's like, look, we, we want people to be relatively careful, so we'll do this, but we don't want to put an overbearing restriction on people either. You know, so you know, people aren't driving thirty-five miles an hour on a straightaway highway with you know five lanes. So there, there, they, we have to do better, essentially, as society, if we want to make this stuff work, because they're always going to be things are going to change. You know, like technology is going to change, customs are going to change. There's going to be cross pollination across things and so forth. So all of that. I mean, it, it's this is one of the issues that reveal that to us because the divisions here are deep and they are calcified. Yeah, yeah, man. So I do want to get into the second topic, um, and you, you had brought this up to me, uh, and it's, it's it, we've talked about this in different ways before in the past and other shows, and but it, it's. It's new, a new finding, so we get to talk about it again. And that's just <laughs> with ancient or, or, or modern man and how far back modern man extends and what all was going on between modern man and all these other human, you know, 
pre man pre modern men that were apparently were walking around. I think you said it's up to nine at this point that they have confirmed. So between oh, nine and twenty one. Oh, between nine on and which 21. ones you read? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, which is just fascinating. Obviously, like we all we see a bunch of Homo sapiens every you know when we look around, but it's fascinating to think that you go you show up somewhere and there's like these human like things, but they're not humans. But you know, beyond that, what what's your thoughts? The the the, the big headline here is that now they're, they're always trying to track the, the minimum age for these remains that they found that the oldest remains they found that are for sure modern man. And it, they thought it was 200,000 years old. Now they're thinking 230 based on samplings as far as uh, volcanic eruptions and so forth that are found with it. So what's your thought on, you know, this research that, that that's establishing that modern humans have been around longer than pre- previously believed and anything else that stuck out to you about this? Yeah, no, it's um, very interesting. I mean, it's um, number one, the, the thing I found interesting, and we've talked about this stuff on several of these science conversations, especially post pandemic. Um, the idea that science is not absolute, and as technology improves and the ability to study things yeah. is refined, that just like with COVID, right? That first it's new, and then after a year, they kind of got a lot better idea how to deal with it. So the 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 um, the, the the guidelines might have changed. Here they they go on from two hundred thousand, thinking that was the oldest uh, that that humans went back in our modern form. Um, now they're going back two hundred thirty thousand years. So again, I was thinking in my head, like you know, a contrarian, like oh, okay, what? How come science always has to change things? And then I started reading. They explained it in one of the articles I read. Um, it had to do with the way that they could break down the radioactive carbon of the volcanic ash yeah. around where the bones were found. And it's just better dating technology now than it was 20 years ago when they found and, it. And they found so, this stuff. They found these remains in, ni- in the 1960s. So, okay. like, so now, yeah, longer than I than yeah, thought. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, it's pretty interesting so, yeah. that, you know, like that they're still able to go back and study this. And, you know, again, with, with as you're pointing out, with better techniques as far as to be able to, to place these things. Yeah. And so one of the things I found interesting, just getting in this again, if you, if you take kind of the theory of evolution um, at its face that, that, you know, um, we've evolved from primates um, that, you know, you got to kind of at least somewhat believe in that to have this conversation, but the idea is why <laughs> I'm setting, I'm setting it off that way because what I'm about to say is uh the idea is that we broke away from chimpanzees and that type of primate about s- somewhere between six and seven million years ago. Yeah. And what happens is there's evidence that over a few million years, there were various species of hominids, you know, yeah. human like creatures. And then somewhere around 300,000 years ago is where we get um, the, the, the kind of trace of Neanderthals, Denisovians. Uh, and 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 the beginning of Homo sapiens, you know, around two two hundred to three hundred thousand years ago, and so and so, um, you know, what I found interesting is they said that some of these species, again, like I said, they're, they're somewhere between nine and twenty one, depending who you read, and and even some of them might branch two into one. You know, some of these yeah. scientific uh, research studies, but what I found interesting is that they said that. Um, the last to die out, they believe, was around ten thousand years ago. Yeah, and then and then it was humans alone. You know what I was thinking, man? Just interesting about. It. I, I don't think as humans we appreciate how powerful our culture is, um, in terms of all of us, like oral history, all this. I mean, think about it: the Bible and the Christian and Jewish and Muslim religions are still the most powerful things in the world, and are thousands of years old. Yeah. So, you know, this idea that we can hold on to ideas in our culture as humans for a long time um, isn't new. And I was thinking about like, well, the Jewish religion, for example, Judaism, 6,000 years old. And just like everything else, Judaism probably came from other stuff, right? Yeah. And I was thinking, man, if something was going on, it was around 10,000 years ago that looked like a human, but wasn't. I was thinking (laughs) that could be where, well, but that's on a serious note, that's where ideas like hobbits or the Yeti, or 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 you know, yes. um, Bigfoot could have come from meaning. Yes. We could have been human beings like us sitting around a campfire. Could have been dealing with some things that looked like us but weren't us. They were hairy. Yes. They were a little bit scarier. 
And you're sitting there telling stories, trying to get your kids to be good, you know, when they're little. And you're saying, oh, that guy in the mountain cave is going to come get you. Yeah. And it might have really been some, some homo some erectus thing. or, yeah, or yeah. some Neanderthal or something. So that's what I, that was the first time when I saw that it was <laughs> as late, as, as recent as 10,000 years ago, we still had non-human hominids on the earth. That was kind of cool. I was like, damn, like. Like that's probably where a lot of our, you know, yeah, uh, scary stories are coming from. You no, know, of and course. All this I mean, stuff. that's. I mean, for real, like that. That's a really excellent point that you made. Like that is a, a very plausible explanation of Bigfoot, so to speak. Yeah, you know, exactly. some some species of Homo that was not Homo sapiens. And to me, the progression is what really is fascinating in the sense that a lot of times when people talk about, okay, yeah. Homo, the Homo species, which is, you know, Homo sapiens, but also Homo neanderthalus and all that, you know, all these different humans. I'm, I'm just glad we're mature adults because the amount of times you say in Homo, man, I can see <laughs> if I was a teenager, we'd have some bad jokes right now. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. But like you see these and they're not here anymore. So if you do buy evolution, then you then look and say, okay, well, we conceivably are improvements of them. Like we are at the top of that pyramid, so to speak, that they were a step of, and we either wiped them out, which I did one of the pieces that <laughs> yeah. you sent me on this goes into that. Which I'll, 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 touch let you, yeah, I'll let you get into that. <laughs> or, you know, we out competed them in general. Like we, we got all the food, they didn't get any of the food. And that was that. And then we've talked, I've known in previous shows, we talked about how we could have also just incorporated them in, in smaller amounts into ours, you know, and start mating with them and, and whatever. But, like to me, that's the fascinating part of this is that the, you know, you had, you would have, if you were, yeah, if you were walking around, uh, one of these things we're looking at talks about, you know, if you're going back 200,000 years, you, you're going to have, you know, maybe 10 species of homo uh, beings walking around, you know, now granted, yeah. you're not traveling the world. So you're only going to, you know, not going to run into everybody, but just that you're going to have that going on. And at a certain point, my homo sapiens, modern humans probably realize like, yo, we're the big dogs here. You know, we're the big dogs here. So like we keep growing and advancing and eventually you're spread out all over the world. And so as we once we get into our recorded history, which you're looking to religion for that, you know, the or- earliest recorded history, you were probably looking at religious documents for that. And that's we can you know rely on them as much as we could rely on anything that was six thousand years old. But like once we get to that point. Homo sapiens had been through a lot. Homo sapiens had taken over the world, essentially. You know, so to me, that progression is just fascinating. Like, because we, yeah, we can't imagine. Like, yeah. oh yeah, I'm gonna go into this, go, go, I'm gonna go, go to this, you know, island, and then there's just a whole bunch of little things running around that walk like us and talk like us, but they're clearly not us. Or big yeah. things, you know, like that. And I, and that's the thing too, because you know, I think there was different discussion where I I mentioned that there's the estimated population of the world 2000 years ago. So let's say around the time of Jesus, they estimate there was somewhere between 180 million to 200 million human beings on earth. Mm -hmm. So think about 8,000 years prior to that, when there was, you know, if if around 10,000 years ago, if if, if that's when the last of these other humanoids or whatever you want to call it, the the homos (laughs) were around, um, you got to imagine how many fewer humans, Homo sapiens, there were. Yeah, I mean, there might have only been a million yeah. few Homo sapiens around. So think about how vast and open the Earth would have been without just humans. And like you're saying, for I could see it take maybe a hundred thousand years for us to get rid of all of them because of just the vastness of the Earth. You know, like yeah. like just to, to to be able to navigate across seas, all that, and find these other beings. And that was the interesting thing that one of the articles I read. It said. Um, I'll quote here. It says, we are uniquely, <laughs> says about humans, human beings. We are a uniquely dangerous species. We hunted the woolly mammoth, ground sloths, and moas to extinction. We destroyed plains and forests for farming, modifying over half the world, the land, uh, the planet's land area. And so, and so it's basically getting at that because of our brains and our intelligence. And they said, and the article goes on to kind of say, once we figured out how to do like really hunt, um, and have our societies that might have been the death nail for these other hominid groups because yeah. we may have just been able to outsmart them literally and 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 but the other thing to your point about um i think you mentioned that we may have uh interbred with them i mean the evidence is there where um uh people from australia like aboriginal australians and people from 
South and Eastern Asia, um, you know, I would say Thailand, Vietnam, all, all up to China and, and Japan side of things have the Denisovian uh, DNA in them still today, yeah. the humans. And then most of every other human outside of sub-Saharan Africans um, have Neanderthal DNA in them. So it goes, it stands to reason that, you know, humans didn't exterminate all of these other hominids that we must have interbred with them and their offspring were allowed to live, yeah. you know, so that the rest of us have this. And I would say this, this is where kind of reading this stuff makes you realize more that race is a human construct built on, you know, social order and, and, and it's BS because the fact we all have, all of us except sub-Saharan Africans have Neanderthal and Denisovian DNA in us means that the sub-Saharan Africans must be the pure humans. <laughs> the rest yeah. of us are, yeah, yeah, including me and you, right? Like meaning in America, people like us are considered black, but we really have a lot of Caucasian in us as well. And that's just life. And that's, so, so these racial structures of modern humans is all about casting us into a social order and hierarchy. Yeah. Whereas, you, know, you see what I'm saying? Well, no, I mean, it, it, you know, it, and when you look at the racial thing now, what's interesting to me about that is almost like we're hardwired to do that in the sense that I'm sure that this, these same things were done when there were all these different yeah, exactly. Almost species around and like, and they <laughs> actually were different at that point. Yeah. And there may have been people saying, "Oh, we need to treat them the same," and or we need to <laughs> bring them into the village. And hey, yeah, they but may- he's hairy all over, <laughs> <laughs> and he's either nine feet tall or two feet tall. He's not the same. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so you're right; it's the same thing as today. Yeah, so like, it, it might be one of those things that I mean, and, and this has kind of been shown with with just psychology, like we do fixate on differences. You know, we as human beings, we fixate on differences. And so we can be in a society where relatively, relative to the United States, for example, everybody looks the same or has, you know, more or less the same religion. And we'd still find a way to, 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 to divide ourselves and then, you know, attack the other, you know, whatever that would be. And then we could be in a place like this and, you know, like it, it it's, we, we pick the things like instead of we will have a bunch of things we can pick from in terms of how we're going to divide ourselves. We'll pick one or one will be picked for us from a cultural standpoint and we'll just roll with that and disregard other things where we have sim- may have similarities with people that are in a different quote unquote group from us and differences from the people that are in the same group with us because we, we prioritize, so to speak, where we're going to distinguish ourselves. You know, so it, you imagine it, if human beings did that. <laughs> Human beings do that. <laughs> like that. that's what my point could is. Can you is imagine? I, I how, how, could you imagine how how dysfunctional the world would be if people did that? Well, but I think honestly, though, that <laughs> is actually the the one of the the things that distinguishes the um, the American American effort, the American attempt, the American experience experience in the sense that it has definitely not lived up to the ideals that it set forth. But those are some pretty high ideals, you know, in terms of how people operate. And have operated in human nature and so forth. It's pretty. It's pretty high ideal to try to set up a society to lead, even say it, as you pointed out. With, with, you know, with again, not to pick on China, most countries don't even try to get out here and say like, yeah, yeah, yeah. everybody's equal under the law. Like most countries, they're like, Psh, nah. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> people who have the stuff say, nah, I'm not equal to you. You know, type of thing. So it's it's an interesting light that we can look at ourselves at. And like I said, I think that that's something that Americans should be proud of, you know, like a lot of times Americans want to be proud of, you know, this or that or whatever. But uh, one of the things that Americans I think should be proud of and is the aspiration to try to go beyond kind of the, the lowest common denominator. And even though it doesn't succeed, you know, like America, you know, the, you know, the problem is with, for this specific conversation was that you got to believe that the earth wasn't created in six days. Well, and then, uh, and then, and then you got to believe that that shouldn't be in the law. So that's, that's, we got, uh, we got a long point. ways to go before we get to this. Well, but I'll point. tell you this. I would think that if someone was an originalist from a constitution standpoint, <laughs> I think they'd be able to get there. But I don't know. No, I don't know. You know like we, we never know. So, But no, I think we can wrap it up from here, man. Um, but we That was a good one. That was a good one, though. <laughs> I'm thinking how the founding fathers were actually deists. So that's, you know, so they would have believed in evolution, actually. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know it, what I mean? It, it's, it's actually it came out of the enlightenment. That's why I said that was a good one. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. No, it came out of the enlightenment. Which, in hindsight, you know, a lot of the things they were saying with the enlightenment are kind of you know Pollyannish and not really true how things play out as far as how reason. And we're going to get into this and in, yeah, yeah. And now reason dominates and everything like that. And emotion is is no, a, but as, you know, as a they hindrance. they believe that God is real and God created kind of the big bang, like basically that God was a was a watchmaker. Yeah. That he's, he made the watch, set it, and then let it go. That yeah. he doesn't, that's what Deus believed, that God doesn't control our every day-to-day moves. So someone like their founding fathers, being Deus, could believe that God created the earth, and from there, evolution could have happened on its own. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, but all of that, though, it still ultimately comes down I guess to- I'm an originalist, because I know what the founding fathers were thinking, right? There you go. There you yeah, go. so- but- it all comes down to like we, yeah, we, we believe we tell like our stories. We tell ourselves the stories that we want to believe, regardless. All of that, you know, like so. And I'm not. <laughs> are, you, are you saying I was just doing that? And I'm just saying that <laughs> you can. It, human beings are uniquely capable of believing whatever they want to believe. That's probably why we outcompeted all those other species. Because maybe I'm like maybe I'm one of those other ones. Like, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a homo something. I gotta figure out that last part. <laughs> Yeah, man, you're big. Right, let me go talk to my wife and see which one I am. She'll tell you. She'll have a better idea. But nah. But I think we can wrap right. in here, man. Yeah, I think we need to before I say something <laughs> stupid. <laughs> well, we appreciate everybody for joining us on this episode of Call It Like I See It. Subscribe to the podcast, rate it, review us, tell us what you think, and uh, just share it with your friends. And until next time, I'm James Keys. I'm Tunde Guilana. All right, we'll talk to you next time.